Hi. Welcome. Good morning to you all and welcome. We're supposed to start at 9.15 and so as we are doing that, maybe there will be some more guests who will pour in. Um, this morning, I have the distinct privilege of introducing Mr. John F. Sopko and his team to you. John Sopko is the U.S. Special Inspector General of Afghanistan Reconstruction, SIGAR, a position he has held since July 2nd, 2012. Mr. Sopko has more than 30 years of experience as an investigator, a prosecutor, a congressional counsel, and a senior U.S. federal government advisor. His government experience includes over 20 years in Capitol Hill, where he held key positions in both the Senate and House of Representatives. Just to give you a glimpse of some of his work during the course of his illustrious career, John Sofko served on the staffs of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, the Select Committee on Homeland Security, and the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. As the General Counsel and Chief Oversight Counsel for the House Select Committee on Homeland Security, Mr. Sopko focused on homeland security and counterterrorism investigation and related issues. At the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations, he conducted multi-year investigations on a broad range of issues, from healthcare insurance, protection of critical infrastructure, and potential spread of we weapons of mass destruction, to international drug interdiction programs, government procurement fraud, cybersecurity, etc. Mr. Sokko and his team conducts regular audits and investigations of reconstruction activities in Afghanistan, not only to promote efficiency and effectiveness of reconstruction programs, but also ensure accountability of U.S. funds invested in Afghanistan and detect and prevent it, waste and abuse of aid funds. The mandate he addresses and the reports he presents <clears throat> are truly remarkable, providing deep insights into aid effectiveness <clears throat> and value for money. No other country that is involved in Afghanistan's reconstruction as part of the international community's efforts there performs such critically important oversight functions. Accompanying John this morning are Mr. Robert B. Lawrence and Jennifer George Nicole. As the Deputy Director for House Affairs at CIGAR, Robert Lawrence is responsible for CIGAR's interactions with the U.S. House of Representatives and CIGAR's relationships with think tanks, universities, and non-governmental organizations. Ms. Jennifer Nicole serves as the Communications and Public Affairs Specialist for SIGAR. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Mr. Sopko and his team. for that very kind introduction. Uh, and I also want to thank you and the University of Ottawa uh, for inviting me here to speak today and actually to invite me back to speak. So obviously I wasn't too bad a year and a half ago. So it's a pleasure always to come to Ottawa and always to come to Canada and to uh, meet uh, Dr. Nipa and her colleagues, uh, a number of who have helped us um, in our work in Afghanistan. And I just want to say one thing about it. I mean, uh, this university here and this program here looking at failed states <laughs> is unique. And as I've spent six years looking at Afghanistan, I've noticed sort of 
emeralds and gems out there that we should support. And I think the work of Nipa and her team and the other people here is fantastic. And you should all be proud of this university and your university and your country for doing this type of research. As I mentioned, I was here about 18 months ago. I tell you, the weather has improved. Uh, remember, it was snowing back then. Uh, it has been glorious the two days I've been here. And I hope it continues. Well, I think now fall is finally upon us. Uh, a lot has happened in Afghanistan in those 18 months. Uh, a lot has happened that is important for you, important for my discussion today. We have a great new ambassador, U.S. ambassador in Afghanistan, John Bass. Came from out of Turkey. I've uh, worked with him, he's fantastic. I think he's one of the best ambassadors we've had there. We have a new NATO commanding general, Scott Miller, who I haven't personally met in his new position, but I've met before. He's a fantastic commander. I look forward to working with him. More importantly, we have a new South Asian policy outlined by <coughs> President Trump, which both of them and the rest of the U.S. government are trying to implement. But unfortunately, there is a great deal that has not changed in Afghanistan. In the words of former American ambassador, quote, if present trends continue, five years from now, Afghanistan is likely to look very much like it does today. Reconstruction stagnation, a weak central government, starved of resources, unable to extend its influence to regions where oppressive warlords reign, opium production soaring, and guerrilla warfare on the Afghan-Pakistan border generated by Pakistan-based and supported Muslim extremists. Ambassador Thompson's prediction of Afghanistan was tragically prescient because he uttered those words not last year, not 18 months ago, not five years ago, but back in 2003. Given recent Taliban attacks in Ghazni and Bagalan provinces, a spate of increased violence in Kabul, and the fact that the United States to date has spent $126 billion over 17 years on reconstruction alone, one can reasonably ask how much has changed since Ambassador Thompson's statement and wonder where the current effort stands. Since I was last in Ottawa, SIGAR has released numerous audits, inspections and reports, and indicted a few Americans. In addition, we have released four lessons learned reports, focusing on the effort to rebuild Afghan security forces, our efforts to develop Afghanistan's private sector economy, on stabilization efforts undertaken in Afghanistan, and on counter-narcotics uh, efforts. These four reports join SIGAR's inaugural Lessons Learned report published in 2016, which focused on anti-corruption efforts. I have the reports here. You can see they are a hefty series of tomes. So I'll just leave them here for the time being. Uh, there are many lessons to learn in Afghanistan. As I was asked the other day by a reporter for the Globe and Mail about are we going to be there for 17 more years? My answer was, we will be, I hope not, but we will be unless we learn the lessons from the last 17 years. All five of those reports, for those of you who don't like to lug around about 100 pounds of paper, uh, we're trying to help the paper industry, I hope you realize. Uh, all of those are available on our website, and I highly recommend you go to it, www.cigar.mil. They are available both print for downloading, and more importantly, and Jen I give credit for, we've turned them all into interactive reports that are very useful for people. So please look at them. They will be the subject of my discussion today. While SIGAR is not done with its lessons learned effort, we are currently working on four additional lessons learned reports and plan to produce several more for the years to come. We have distilled the five published reports into what we consider the ten most important and consistently observed lessons of American and coalition engagement. The common threads 
through those five reports and our wealth of other work there. They include persistent insecurity and uncertainty about the future, a lack of comprehensive and coordinated strategies within the U.S. government and coalition partners, misaligned priorities between the United States coalition and the government of Afghanistan, a failure to understand the Afghan environment, insufficient monitoring and evaluation, spending decisions, exacerbated by corruption, <coughs> the failure to take into account the Afghan government's actual capabilities and political will, politically driven timelines, and counterproductive military and civilian personnel policies. I think NEPA and the, the next panel that I'll be discussing will find a lot of those as common threads and problems you've probably seen in Haiti and other countries. Now lastly, our tenth lesson that comes through those reports is that with the right people, the right resources, and I should add the right planning, it is possible to build capacity and do good reconstruction, albeit at a smaller scale. Now by identifying these findings and making these recommendations, our hope as SIGAR is that we may not only be able to improve efforts in Afghanistan, but also similar operations in the future elsewhere in the world. While there has been undeniable success in Afghanistan, there has also been unquestionable failure and continuing challenges. Progress has been slow, and many lessons could have and should have been learned since late 2001. Now, some of you may be asking, on this fine morning, why you, as Canadians, should care about the lessons from SIGAR, and particularly the lessons from an American. Good question. After all, Canada has withdrawn its troops from Afghanistan. Those dusty battlefields where 40,000 of your brave comrades served over 1,900 who were wounded, and 159 who made the ultimate sacrifice. For one reason you should be interested as a Canadian is your government still views Afghanistan as an important national foreign policy issue. Secondly, you should be interested in it because your government, you the taxpayer, are paying Canadian dollars in Afghanistan right now to the tune of hundreds of millions of Canadian dollars. But perhaps more importantly to you as a Canadian, you should be aware that stabilization and reconstruction activities have a long history. A long history not only with Canada, but the United States, but a long history throughout the world, and it is something that no doubt will be undertaken again. We will do this again. I can attest to that. Despite the assurances by everybody in any government that we're never going to do it again, we're planning to do it again. And Canada, should it choose, as a great country, will probably have a role. So as I told that Globe and Mail reporter, and I tell you, we should learn from the 17-year experience in Afghanistan. You as Canadians, we as Americans. And that is why we did the Lessons Learned Report. Maybe Afghanistan again, we'll be there. Maybe in Iraq and maybe in Syria, we don't know. But we will do this again. And just as we should listen and learn from this experience, you need to listen and learn to the next panel which will be discussing the Canadian experience in Haiti and elsewhere. Now, the other question you may ask is why you should be listening to me. Why am I listening to this American? Funny accent. Uh, well, it's not just me, but SIGAR is a unique organization which is positioned uniquely to play a role in identifying best practices and lessons from that longest war. 
in part because we are an independent body and not housed in any one U.S. government agency. This makes us the only entity with the authority, capability, and independence to look at all of U.S. efforts in Afghanistan in a truly holistic way. As General John Allen on that picture informed me, he's the former U.S. and NATO commander, and he pointed that out to me shortly after I took the job. He said, John, you're the only agency that can do a whole of government look at the Afghan experience. This point hit home with me because while SIGAR was finding waste, fraud, and abuse nearly everywhere we looked in Afghanistan, from $488 million worth of aircraft we bought for the Afghans that could not fly, to a navy we bought for the landlocked country, to buildings our government paid for that literally melted when it rained, I was consistently being asked by people like John Allen, by the Congress, and by people, other senior officials, what does all of this mean in the larger context of reconstruction and development? I was also frustrated that individual agencies and good people in those U.S. agencies were constrained from deriving any long-term lessons in Afghanistan and adjusting their operations accordingly, largely because their personnel in Afghanistan rotated out every six months or nine months or a year, what we call the annual lobotomy. To paraphrase Army Officer John Paul Vann's comments about the U.S. experience in Vietnam, we don't have 17 years of experience in Afghanistan. We have one year's experience 17 times over. Additionally, if an agency should accidentally do produce, or does produce, a lessons learned report, it rarely, if ever, looks at the whole issue. It rarely, if ever, is produced to look at how we work with the coalition. And it is rarely, if ever, coordinated with our coalition partners or with other U.S. government agencies. We also learn, furthermore, that lessons learned efforts that were undertaken were often long forgotten by the time they were needed again. Now, my own staff in college found a 1988 USAID Lessons Learned report entitled, quote, A Retrospective Review of U.S. Assistance to Afghanistan, 1950-1979. You would think that would be relevant. You would think somebody would have read it. Because if you did read the report, you would find that many of the things they highlighted were extremely relevant to aid and state and the Department of Defense. And when we found that report, I could not find a single living human being in the U.S. Embassy who ever read it, ever knew its recommendations, its findings, or even knew of its existence. Now, when you undertake an effort like we have in these lessons learned reports, you obviously are goring somebody's ox. The programs, projects, policies, and strategies SIGAR has reviewed all were the result of decisions made by people who, in large part, were doing the best they could at the time and with the time they had. But despite the fact that our lessons learned reports identify failures, missed opportunities, and bad judgment, the response to those reports by our people and our government has been generally positive. The Defense Department was especially interested in our review of efforts to rebuild the Afghan security forces, asking us to brief numerous senior officials, including the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Joe Dunford, who I briefed for an hour and a half. And I'll tell you this, you may not know the military, but Joe Dunford doesn't give anybody an hour and a half. Particularly, he doesn't give an IG, usually, and I don't have to brief him. But he was very interested in our findings and what it meant for him going forward and for him developing the policies that were ultimately adopted by the new administration. And he asked us, based upon that report and our other work, 
to join a joint failure analysis, analysis team. So we were the only IG asked to donate staff to do a failure analysis team. He was looking back to see what failed so we wouldn't repeat it in the future. Our report on stabilization, and I had a good conversation with somebody from your Ministry of Defense here uh, who is acquainted with it. The State Department, USAID, and DOD utilized the findings of that report and the work for that report for the release of their own stabilization assistance review. And I just recently sent my deputy to the UK where he briefed over 90 senior and mid-level officials in their Ministry of Defense, their DFID, and their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, on its findings because they, wanted to, they felt it was relevant to their work on stabilization around the world. We also had requests from the German government and other governments to do it, just we don't have, we have a limited budget and we haven't been able to send people there yet. Uh, now, while I don't have time to discuss those 10 big themes uh, in the time allotted, I do want to focus on five of them. Five key ones. The five takeaways that you should think about. And hopefully it'll pique your interest in looking at these reports. They are the impact of continuing insecurity on Reconstruction, corruption, and how the U.S. and coalition contributed to it and its impact on Reconstruction, the impact from the lack of comprehensive strategies, the effect again of politically driven timelines, and that counterproductive personnel policies. Let's look at the negative impact of continuing insecurity. One of the most important common themes across all five of our lessons learned reports was that security is critical component needed for Reconstruction to succeed. That makes sense. It was totally ignored. While U.S. and coalition military operations in late 2001 were largely successful by early 2002, there was a misconception in our capital that Afghanistan was in a post-conflict state. For example, in 2003, the White House proposed just $151 million, $151 million U.S. assistance for Afghanistan. A figure that included a whopping $1 million for the Afghan military. Now, Congress later had to increase that to just under $1 billion. But the message was clear. The United States <coughs> intended to maintain a light footprint and did not foresee the Taliban coming back and re-emerging. Now, accelerating the return of the Taliban was the coalition's reliance on warlords that the Taliban themselves had pushed out and that the many Afghans themselves hated. The coalition paid those warlords not only to provide security, but in many cases to run the provincial and district governments. One U.S. senior official told us that it was seen as a pragmatic approach that it was necessary to work with unsavory characters in order to pursue U.S. counterterrorism reforms. And there was an assumption that the U.S. would eventually hold those power brokers to account. Only that rarely, if ever, did that happen. The abuses, whether political, economic, or purely violent, committed by coalition-aligned Afghans, turned again many frustrated Afghans back into the hands of the growing Taliban insurgency. The deterioration of security that, it followed, that followed negatively impacted virtually every U.S. initiative in Afghanistan and they affect it even negatively to this day. For example, as the Taliban threat grew, efforts to sustain and professionalize the Afghan security forces became secondary to immediate combat needs. The coalition built, or attempted to build, the Afghan force that the U.S. and coalition needed at the time, a force that would allow us to bring our troops home. There was little concern, our studies have shown, for the capabilities and resources the Afghans would be left with once those coalition forces departed. A decade and a half later, the Afghan security forces still cannot sustain themselves by themselves. So we continue to have to spend billions annually to support them. 
Afghanistan's economy was also negatively impacted. And again, if you look at our report on private sector development, you will see this uh, documented. It was negatively impacted by increasing insecurity, which discouraged trade, investment, and other economic activities. It also increased the difficulty of building government institutions needed to support the private sector. In particular, the U.S. government's announcement of the military drawdown and the resultant anticipa anticipation of dramatic aid reductions reinforced existing uncertainty and pessimism in Afghanistan about the economy and fostered what we all know, we've all heard this term before, the last call mentality. You know, it's 2 a.m. or maybe it's 3 a.m. and oh, and it's last call. Drink all you can. Well, that happened in the economy, and that happened with corruption. People in Afghanistan, not all Afghans, but some of the corrupt ones, last call, the Americans are leaving. Steal everything you can. And that had a dramatic impact on our reconstruction efforts. Something that has had a lasting impact today. Which leads me right into the second important theme, and that's the theme of corruption. The second, that's our second key lesson, major lesson from our reports. Corruption has negatively affected the reconstruction effort and the coalition. Particularly the United States, unfortunately, have exacerbated that problem in Afghanistan. The injection of billions of dollars into the Afghan economy by international donors led by the United States, when combined with the limited ability of the Afghan government to expend funds, poor donor oversight, and contracting practices and institutional incentives to spend money quickly increase the risks of corruption. Simply put, we spent too much money, too fast, in too small a country with too little oversight. While the West has berated Afghanistan for being, according to Transparency International, the fourth most corrupt country in the world, trust me, it had help getting there. The $126 billion the U.S. alone spent on reconstruction was more than we spent on the Marshall Plan to rebuild all of Europe after World War II. And it flooded the Afghan economy and had a direct impact on the economy and on many sectors of that portfolio. Now remember, that $126 billion does not include the estimated $700 billion additionally that the U.S. spent in Afghanistan over the same time period to fight the war. And it does not include the billions given by the coalition. Now most development economists, like the people here at this university, told us and all agree that the generally accepted amount of foreign aid a country can absorb is between 15 and 45 percent of the GDP of that country. Afghanistan, with a relatively small economy, would be able to safely absorb a number closer to the bottom. Most anything more spills over into the illicit economy, just like when you put a sponge on your kitchen sink and you pour water. It'll hold it, it'll hold it, it'll hold it, and all of a sudden, it floods out. That's what happens to an economy when you overload it with money. By 2004, aid to Afghanistan from just the United States consistently exceeded 45% of the GDP and in some years exceeded 100% of the GDP. So are we surprised there's waste? Are we surprised there's failure? And we're not even including the money given by the coalition, given by Canada, that also distorted the Afghan economy. Remember, Canada gave $3 billion alone to the reconstruction effort in Afghanistan. As former U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates put it, quote, for all of our hand-wringing and hectoring of the Afghans on corruption, we seem oblivious to how much we were contributing it and on a scale that even dwarfed the drug trade there. <clears throat> Tens of billions of dollars were flooding into Afghanistan from the U.S. and our partners, and we turned a blind eye or were simply ignorant of how regularly some portion was going to go to payoffs, bribes, and bank accounts in Dubai, unquote. 
And I would add bank accounts here in Canada and investments in Northern Virginia and California. The U.S. government's historic inclination to believe, and that's part of our U.S. I'm an American. We believe in this. If there's a problem, throw money at it. And if the problem continues, throw more money at it. And eventually, we hope, will succeed. But that attitude exacerbates the problem, makes it only worse. The stabilization effort in Afghanistan was derailed as money spent, rather than outcomes of those expenditures, became the metric of success for many of our officials. On that point, as our reports have repeatedly noted, our agencies and our government are very good at measuring inputs. That's the amount of money spent. They're decent at measuring outputs. The amount of roads built, clinics built, schools built, soldiers trained, boots given to soldiers, M16s given to soldiers. But time and again, we see little of any focus by our government, by our officials, by our Congress on the outcome. Remember, inputs, outputs, outcomes. If you walk away from this speech, three words you should remember. Let's do other ones. Hubris and mendacity. But anyway, those three is your focus. Inputs, outputs, outcomes. As an auditor, we so often just focus on inputs and outputs. What's the outcome? You built the clinic, but does it have it running water? Does it have doctors? Does it have nurses? Does it have medicine? Does it allow the Afghan people to use it? Why build the clinic if it's not being used? More importantly, why build the clinic if the Afghans cannot maintain it and use it after we leave? Except for some instantaneous gratification that we cut a ribbon and there's a shiny new object. It doesn't help the Afghan people. And if anything, it makes them cynical. That's what we're talking about, inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And that's what we spend so much time on our reports trying to beat into the policymakers and the implementers. What is the outcome of what you're doing there? Now, there's no more classic example of this problem of not focusing on outcomes than the counter-narcotics program in Afghanistan. Excuse me, sir. And I highly recommend all of you to read this, particularly you in Canada, since most of your opium comes from Afghanistan. We spent $8.6 billion, $8.6 billion U.S., not Canadian, on fighting narcotics. And if you listen to the speeches given by the State Department and DEA and everybody else, great success. But if you look at any indicia of success or failure, it was a total abysmal failure. Crop production is up. Opium production is up. Exports of drugs are up. The amount of, going to the, the amount of money being taxed and going to the Taliban is up. The amount of money being stolen and given as bribes to government officials is up. Now we come in and say, oh, but the amount of interdictions has increased. Great. The amount of interdictions we have made in Afghanistan for all 17 years, the amount of we've seized, amounts to less than 1% of the drugs produced last year. But that's a raving success. Why? Because we looked at inputs, outputs, and then outcomes. But I think that's something for you to particularly focus on. Now, by 2013, we in the United States recognized that corruption was a problem. Unfortunately, it wasn't until 2014, the year afterwards, 13 years into our efforts, we put the first condition on money and equipment and tools and stuff we gave to the Afghans. We never put a condition. How do you expect that's to work? The damage of corruption had already been done by 2014. You look at what happened to the Afghan 215 Corps and Helmet. 
You look at it like Kunduz. Many of the problems is related to the morale due to the corruption. Many of the problems in the 215 phase were due to the fact that the 215 core didn't exist except on paper, to a large extent. Many of those soldiers were ghosts. Their salaries stolen by their officers. And the important thing, as I explained to somebody before, it's not just a salary that we pay for that they stole, but attached to that salary is what we call the long tail. Because we base assistance to the Afghan military based on how many soldiers. And that is, to that soldier, there's not only a salary, there's guns provided, there's equipment provided, there's training provided, there's food providing, there's everything up the line. It's the long tail. That's why you invented it. Because you not only can steal the salary, you can steal the food. You can steal all that other stuff. And who would you sell it to? That's why the Taliban has no problem getting weapons in Afghanistan. They buy them from the Afghan military. Corrupt military officials. Not the honest ones who are living, breathing, and dying out there, but the corrupt ones. More recently, the U.S. Department of Justice attaché, attaché in Kabul told us that Afghanistan has largely become a weak, lawless, and dysfunctional government citing the number of corruption cases languishing due to the lack of political will rather than capacity. I've heard similar statements from our coalition partners and from other Afghans when I go out there. Now, while undoubtedly Afghanistan had a corruption problem prior to 2001, what I'm saying is, and our Lessons Learned report says, the U.S. and coalition acted as throwing gasoline on that smoldering fire. Now, money cannot solve all the world's problems, and where governments do choose to spend it, it must be aware of the operating environment and ensure that proper controls and oversight take place. Next point I want to hit real quickly, because I know I'm probably going over. My staff is being getting nervous. Um, our third lesson had to do with the lack of comprehensive strategies and how that inhibited assistance efforts. One of the most consistent failures Sigar has identified in all our work has been a lack of coherent whole of government strategies to address the problems. Strategies are critical to ensuring that all parties move in the same direction and are especially important when missions like Afghanistan reconstruction requires multiple government agencies and multiple governments. Stabilization efforts were impaired all the time because of frequent battles between our own agencies. Uh, the absence of an anti-corruption strategy allowed security, counterterrorism, and political goals sometimes to trump our anti-corruption goals. Counter-narcotics efforts, as I mentioned, suffered uh, and didn't work in part because of the st strategies not being in place. I don't think we still have an Afghan uh, counter-narcotics strategy in the fights between the various agencies. Now, the effort to build the Afghan security forces specifically required integrated whole of government support from our civilian and military agencies with expertise and training. And not training not only the military, but also training the police. And that was a problem. And a cautionary tale there, and most of you don't realize this, and this is a programmatic problem, is the State Department has the responsibility for training foreign police forces, such as the Afghan National Police. But the state has no capacity to operate in a hostile environment, such as Afghanistan. So therefore, they had the authority and the responsibility, but they couldn't do it and had no money. So who stepped in? The military. Very good, brave, honorable people. But they have no capability to train Afghan police or any police. So what we found out when we went out there, and again, look at our study on the train, advise, and assist mission, we found out we would find Black Hawk pilots, those are helicopters pilots, training the Afghan police. We would find them using uh, audio and videotapes that they used in Serbia and other countries to a basically, well, first of all, very few Afghans I know speak Serbian. But to, to an illiterate police force. We found it so bad that we had trainers who had to go on TV and read and watch NCIS and cops to find out what police did. 
That's still going on. That's the problem when you don't have a strategy and you don't have people following it. it all, that demonstrates the lack of comprehensive, coordinated strategies among agencies. <laughs> Let me focus quickly on artificial timelines. That is a serious problem. That's our fourth of the five lessons. Politically driven timelines undermine the reconstruction effort. Because U.S. military plans for Afghan security force readiness were created in an environment of timelines dictated from Washington, and because those plans consistently underestimated the resilience of the Taliban insurgency and overestimated the capabilities of the Afghan security forces, those forces were ill-prepared to deal with that deteriorating security. As General Allen told me when we were releasing one of our reports before him, we went from an end state to an end date. Examples of the immediate effect of the drawdown was, drawdown was the temporary fall of Kunduz, the failure of the 215 Corps that I talked about. Artificial timelines also hampered hand efforts to develop the Afghan economy as overtly ambitious targets and unrealistically short time frames compromised those programs. An example of what goes wrong when timelines from Washington drive decisions rather than realities in Afghanistan is best shown by what we call TFBSO. And that's not a drink or a sandwich. It's the Task Force for Business and Stability Operations. The Defense Department, fearing USAID's long-term economic development plans would not provide quick benefits that met those timelines, created its own program to jumpstart the Afghan economy. And were appropriated and utilized $675 million. Now as an aside, I recently spoke about this to 700 colonels and lieutenant colonels at the Army War College. Just sort of heck of what I said. How many of you guys have been trained on economic development? Not a, not a soul. Great. Give an agency that doesn't have that as a mission, the mission, and what do you think is going to happen? For $675 million, TFBSO made minimal impact. But spent a lot of money, and some rather questionable decisions were made to say it charitable. Among some of TFBSO's more novel, and you've probably heard about them, was the $2.3 million program to take sexy imported white Italian goats on military airplanes and fly them over. They didn't helo them down, they didn't parachute them down, but they were there to mate with some not so sexy Afghan goats to improve the domestic cashmere crop. Now, mates for some happy Afghan goats but otherwise, as often happens in love and war, things did not turn out as hoped. Because it was rushed, many of the goats had to be killed because they got disease, culled, not sexual diseases, other diseases, uh, that goats face. Uh, I don't want to get into sex education for goats right now. Uh, what it was was the unrealistic timeline. The manager of the program, who was actually a fantastic woman, just tore out her hair and quit in frustration because of how stupid the program was. The key problem arose because TFBSO was trying to accomplish what normally, as she explained to us, would take decades in one year or two years. Adding insult to injury, as of April of last year, we sent a team out and we could find neither hide nor hair nor honeymoon suite of the goats. We assumed they were eaten. TFPSO also spent millions of dollars to build a compressed natural gas station in Sherbagon in an effort to quickly create a compressed national gas market in Afghanistan. Now that sounds great. Unfortunately, there are no other CNG stations in Afghanistan. And there's no really capability of building any CNG stations outside of Sherbagon. There's also another problem. There were no cars that used CNG. And to retrofit a car was the cost of approximately a year or two's salary for the average Afghan. Ah, 
That's not a problem. The U.S. taxpayer was stepped in. So we happily or ignorantly paid to convert a number of taxis to run on CNG so we could justify the CNG gas station and the millions of dollars spent. The station began operation in 2012, but to our knowledge remains the sole CNG filling station in the entire country. Now, a comprehensive cigar audit of TFBSO found that over half of the program's expenditures went to overhead costs or security. So the costs of both that cashmere uh, goat farm and the CNG project were probably considerably higher than I just stated. In fact, an outside consultant hired by DOD estimated that the CNG project alone cost $43 million. The large number of projects and programs that TFBSO expended funds on failed for a number of reasons, obviously, including their manager's penchant for ignoring the need for projects to be sustainable uh, once the U.S. stopped providing funding. TFBSO also routinely failed to conduct adequate risk and market assessments. Um, you know, we're not for this time constraint. The DOD felt they had to do this quickly because the troops were leaving. Uh, one wonders if the initiative would have been undertaken at all. Now, stabilization and counter-narcotics efforts also uh, suffered from unrealistic timelines, and both, both endeavors, by their very nature, takes long time, time that they won't give. Let me turn to this fifth important theme, and that has to do with personnel. I mean, you're probably saying, what? Why are we dealing with that? You know, hire people. Well, the problem is human resourcing is extremely important. Negatively affected, and negatively, the way we do it, it negatively affected reconstruction efforts by inhibiting continuity in institutional memory. Now, I assumed my post in 2012. As I stand here today, I am now working with my fifth U.S. ambassador, my sixth NATO and U.S. commanding general, my eighth head of U.S. Train, Advise, and Assist Command. Some 80% of the U.S. Embassy rotates out every summer. <clears throat> Most military assigned to Afghanistan serve less than a year. I assume the thing equally applies to our Cana your Canadian comrades. Annual rotations of personnel for non-accompanied posts, non-accompanied posts, that's key, like Afghanistan, have long been standard practice for the military, State Department, and aid. And there are understandable reasons for it. But if this annual lobotomy, which everyone we have talked to complains about, is going to continue, ways have got to be found to avoid the routine loss of institutional memory. As our report affirmed, Brief rotational deployments and frequent shifts in command contribute to a lack of proper continuity of effort, a breakdown or gaps in critical U.S. post-country relationships, and a mutual lack of trust. Imagine what the Afghans feel. Oh, you're the new guy. No, oh, wait, you'll be gone soon. And it continually happens. And imagine the poor Afghan minister who has the same experience with the Canadians, the Germans, the UN, the US. I mean, put it, who are you? you? That's what many of the Afghans tell me. I wish you guys would just stop for a minute and stay for a while. That's not a bad country. You never hear long enough to see it. Retired Sergeant Major, most of you have served in the military. Sergeant Major is important. Some of the senior, some the senior on the non officer in the military noted that one tenet of our counterinsurgency doctrine is to know the population. And one-year tours did not give organizations or the community they were supporting the time to get and know one another. Knowing that their deployment would last just a year, commanders knew they had to demonstrate progress so they get a promotion for the next year. As senior State Department <coughs> official Elliot Cohen noted to us, quote, Commanders starting a rotation in Afghanistan would say, hey, this is going to be difficult. Six months later, they'd say, we might be turning the corner. And at the end of their rotation, we have achieved irreversible momentum. Then the next commanding officer would come. He would pronounce immediately, this is going to be difficult, etc., etc. As for the civilians based in Kabul, 
to the British journalist Christine Lamb, who's written tremendously about Afghanistan, she said, quote, it was as if they believed history had only started when they arrived a few months ago. British journalist and current member of parliament Rory Stewart noted to us that individual development officers are never in any one place and rarely in any one organization long enough to be assessed. In fact, their very uselessness benefits them. So short rotations we have found, everyone has complained about them, has affected every aspect of the reconstruction effort and uh, almost every member of the coalition in Afghanistan. <coughs> because military officials are supposed to be, build relationships with their civilian counterparts, which are then lost. <coughs> Advisors to Afghan security units build trust and then depart. And again, Afghan officials are forced to deal with the revolving door of the coalition and American officials. That also affects contracting officers who approve projects knowing they won't be in the country when the project is completed. Therefore, they're not blamed for it when it fails. And the next, their replacement has little, if any, knowledge or interest in the program they inherited. Now, any solution is going to be difficult, but we really need to find an answer to that. So, let me conclude, and it's very difficult, and I apologize if I've gone over, because about this three years of work in those lessons learned reporting. And it's hard to summarize them into five or ten or even twenty. I could speak on one of those reports for three or four hours. I'm happy to do that. I get paid better work. Uh, we think our lessons learned program and effort may be our lasting and most important legacy of our agency. And I'm encouraged that many of the recommendations we have made in all five of those reports uh, have already been implemented and have been accepted in many quarters of the United States government. Uh, and I'm particularly encouraged that senior U.S. policymakers have asked us to conduct additional reports to aid their work. And many of our coalition partners have asked us to look at it. Again, I only work for the U.S. government, but I do take the input from our coalition partners they too know what's going on and we do need their assistance. As I have mentioned, by its very nature, any one of these lessons learned reports, and you'll read them, and you heard, I've been very negative, uh, because those reports do question decisions that were made and question some of the people who made them. But it is to their credit that many of those individuals who we identify in the reports or we identify their policies and may have felt criticized are seeing a value in our work and are asking us to produce more of it. Now this speaks, I'm proud to say, to the quality and the professionalism of my staff. But more importantly, it speaks to the quality and professionalism of those senior policy makers and mid-level operational people in our government agencies who are not only learning the lessons, but trying to apply them. After all, we learn more not from success, but from failure. In that sense, unfortunately, there's still a great deal we can still learn from our Afghan effort. In closing, let me leave you with two interlocking thoughts. One comes from a South Vietnamese general who spoke about Vietnam and said, history is not easy. People are still confused why a huge force in a powerful country like the United States was defeated. But he added, quote, if you do not know your enemy, you will lose every time. To his maxim, I would add an addendum from a former cartoonist and cultural commentator. Walt Kelly. And we often are our worst enemy. My hope is that the ultimate contribution from SIGAR's Lessons Learned program will help us better understand and overcome the real enemy to our success in Afghanistan and elsewhere, which many times is ourselves. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions. Did I run so far over? Okay.
No, I think so we have a great, we take, we take as planned 20 minutes for questions. Sure. So thank you very much. Uh, the floor is open. I would ask you to, if you have a question, to very, very <coughs> quickly introduce yourself. And we only have 20 minutes, so possibly a short and precise question. Um, Let's see how it goes. Do you want me to moderate? Or you want to oh, I can do it. It's a lot easier. I can see everybody. Can they have okay. any questions? I hope I didn't frighten anybody. Okay. Let's go for water, John. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Oh, come on. I didn't silence. You people are too polite. Yes, sir. Or ma'am. I can't. Um, yes, you know, sir. Good morning, sir. And uh, thank you very much for the great work you've been doing for Afghanistan and also for the, for the United States. Do your mission statements only mention that you're working for the Congress and the government of the United States, but you're very popular and very commendable and appraised by the Afghan people. Thank you. It doesn't matter whether they work for the public sector or private. You become very famous and so popular. Uh, my name is Saeed Azam and uh, I'm a refugee here in Canada. Uh, but I recently come from Afghanistan like less than a year. So very good. Any question, sir? My question is that one of the major problems you mentioned is that is the lack of comprehensive strategy. A strategy is based is built based on a vision. So that vision and there should be a mission so that we don't only produce outputs but outcomes, desirable outcomes and predictable outcomes. Correct. How do you envision an Afghanistan in the next 17 years? And what will be the mission that drives that strategy so that where the Americans, other international partners, Afghan people are all stakeholders and partners to that strategy and fulfilling those, achieving those goals and that mission? That will address many questions, including, you know, the uh, the rotation of personnel. Once they know that, everyone knows that we have to push a, a car that has been marked in, 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 in stuck in a problem, to push it into a, a certain direction. Okay. They know how yeah. much they're pushed yeah. and where they are, so they they will be not lost. Okay. Well, that's very good. Um, and, and, and part of this, uh, the simple answer is we need to sit down and listen. To the Afghans. Uh, I'm not saying we have to do everything the Afghans tell us, but I was shocked. I'd only been on the ground for less than a year, and we were running into programs uh, where the Afghans didn't even know we were building a clinic or building a school or building whatever in their district because nobody actually talked to the Afghans. So I think the first thing is you talk about a strategy. We need to sit down. And I think we are now. I, I, I think uh, the unity government and for, for, for a number of years has been trying to work very closely with uh, RS and the coalition. But I'll be honest with you, this is extremely difficult from the simple fact that there are so many moving parts and so many players. And uh, we do need a more definite strategy. We do need to be speaking with one voice uh, when we deal with the Afghans or when we deal with the neighbors around Afghanistan. But I think that is the basic, and I, I, I can't go into a lot of detail because I know other people have some questions, but when you go into this country, first of all, talk to your experts. You know, we have a great number of experts on Afghanistan when we started this in 2001. I don't know if any of them were ever talked. Uh, great number of experts now in Canada on Afghanistan, on these type of wars. They're in the military. I'm pointing to a gentleman who served over there. Uh, they've been doing development work, like Nika and her staff have. Uh, talk to them. You don't, as a government official, or as a member of parliament, or as a, a general, or national security advisor, or head of privy council, whatever, you don't have to take everything, but at least start there as a basis. Then go to the host country and get input from them. Realize where you're operating. I joke about this. Sometimes I thought people thought we were in Norway. You know? I mean, I, I, we just did a report, and I, I'm going to, I have a tendency of talking. I'm, I'm an old trial attorney, and I love talking. <laughs> like I said, I used to get paid by the way. 
you got to bear with me. But we just did a report, and I really hope you get it on the website and read it. And we did an interactive, didn't we, Jen? Yeah. So it's even easier. On our program to help women in Afghanistan, Neepa and I were talking about that because Neepa knows so much about your own program to help women. We spent over two, we have two hundred million dollars to help women in Afghanistan. And when we looked closely, we built the program, we didn't really talk to many Afghan women. Don't you think you ought to do that before you develop a program? It's unbelievable. We spent two hundred million, and I'll tell you one of the funniest things is, our, our, our head of USAID, Rod Shaw, I think it's Ron Shaw, or Rod Shaw, Rod Raj, Raj, announces the program as the largest women's development program in the history of the world. I think going back to Hammurabi, I don't know, but it's the largest women's program. $200 million, and on top of that, our coalition partners will donate $200 million to it. So, I'm just a simple country lawyer. But I go to Afghanistan every three months. And usually one of the coalition partners, the ambassadors, invites me to dinner and brings all the other coalition ambassadors there. So I'm sitting in, I don't know who, and I can't say who hosted me. Maybe the Canadian ambassador. We're very close relations. Your Canadian ambassadors have been great, just so you know that. You should be proud of all of them. So I'm not at dinner, and there's a Canadian ambassador, the British ambassador, the U.S. What well, the U.S. wasn't there. The, uh, all the various countries, Germany. I said, okay, hey guys, I've been telling you about what I know about Afghanistan. Tell me, what are you guys going to do in the promote program? And just like that question to those colonels, <laughs> that was just like crickets, no noise. I said, the promote program. And one of the ambassadors said, what promote program? I said, the one you agreed to give $200 million for. And I said, we never agreed to any. Did we talk to our coalition? Now, we didn't talk to the Afghans. I met Mrs. Ghani, the president's wife. She said, you're not talking to the women. She says, I know you didn't talk to the women because you say you're going to help every woman in Afghanistan, poor, rich, in Kabul, out in the countryside. But one of your preconditions is they have to have a high school degree. By definition, you now have eliminated 99% of the Afghan women. You know that as well as I do. So did we talk to Afghan women? Were we actually going to help Afghan women? Or was this just a public relations stunt to the tune of $200 million of U.S. taxpayer money? The poor, suffering U.S. taxpayer. The poor, suffering Afghan women. I was just quoted in the New York Times saying, I feel sorry for them because we cheated. So now we've spent $98 million. And oh, by the way, we were supposed to help 75,000 women. And I think one of the newspapers, I don't know which one, said we'd helped 50. 60. Oh, okay, that's right. Ten more. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we're speaking, ten more. The unit cost. What? 55. Okay. But then we kept changing the goals. So, I tell you're going to learn three words. Inputs, outputs, outcome, two other words. Hubris, hubris. I always mispronounce it, so Ohio definition, pronunciation. And mendacity. Hubris, that we thought we could help 75,000 Afghan women all around the country, from the poorest village to the center of Kabul, when we knew U.S. troops and coalition troops were leaving, and we knew that security was deteriorating, that's hubris. Mendacity. You all know the word. If not, see the movie, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. It was all speech about mendacity. Lying. There's a smell of mendacity in this room. Many times when I go to briefings, from the U.S. government, I had that smell. <laughs> you lied to Congress. You lied to the American taxpayer. You lied to the Afghan people. Shame on you. 
I think we, the American taxpayer, I'm, I'm familiar, maybe I'm old school. I believe what Lincoln said. You give the facts to the American people, and we are safe. And I'm not blaming any one official or any one administration. This program was designed under the last administration, so I don't want anybody to walk away from Ah, he's criticizing President so and so. No, this, this is common. We oversell. So anyway, I'm sorry, I went too far in answering that question, but I just had to tell you about that women's program. Please go online and see it. Jen did a great job of doing the interactive. Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious why you think future nation building is inevitable. Like, was there nothing in your research and your studies that was an option that just maybe not to do future nation building? They may call it, I mean, not nation building. I'm talking about stabilization and, and development. Uh, the nation building, I don't know what nation building is. You know, nation building is one of those terms. It's always in the negative. We don't do it. He doesn't do it. She doesn't do it. But you do it. What is nation building? I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot. What is it? I would say trying to shape a country into the image of the West or your image, oh. whatever country is. Okay. Let me ask you a more practical question. This is what I did. And again, I don't mean, I used to teach too. I like to do that. Okay. So I give an Afghan soldier a gun. Is that nation building? I'm not sure. I give him an M16, Western gun, not an AK-47. Is that nation building? And again, you don't have to answer the questions. This is rhetorical. I give them a manual that goes with the gun, which is very important. You don't, you don't clean that gun, it jams, and you get killed. Okay? So I give them, is that nation building? I give them a manual that's written in Dari or Pashtun, and he doesn't speak either, so I send him to school to learn. Is that nation building? I give them the bullets to do it. I pay a salary. Tell me when nation building starts. All I know is in Washington, D.C., if you mention the word nation building, it's like you've got the scarlet A, or in this case, the scarlet N on your. No, we don't do nation building. When does nation building start? It's a good point you make. Why do I say we're doing it? Because look at Syria. Look at the statements made by General Votel and the head of USAID when he talked about we're going to do stabilization. Is stabilization nation building? I don't know. We're going to do it again. <laughs> Because whatever you call it, you could call it the, you know, I'm going to say something that's probably not politically correct, but you can call it whatever you want to call it. We're going to be faced with a country that's of a national security interest to your country and my country and to others. That has problems with corruption, a poor military, lousy police, has got a counter-narcotics problem coming out of yin-yang, and we need to help them. We know that's going to happen. It could be Yemen. It could be going back into Iraq. It could be continuing in Afghanistan. It could be going to Syria. You name it. We will do it. So we better learn how to do it. It may be going back to Colombia. God forbid. You know, we hope they work their way through. But that's what we're doing. We're helping Colombia. So keep that in mind. Yes. Oh, time. I'm sorry. I'm speaking too long. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Gondry. I'm on the charge of Afghanistan Embassy, but I don't. I don't want to speak from the on behalf of the embassy and the government. But definitely, when I look at the issue from from practitioner practitioner of 21 years of development and stability, and I share this what you just John spoke. I love it. I love the closure of PRG that was managing the process with the you know executive president. I was the one who was managing the stability and winning hearts and minds, particularly trying to coordinate the international security efforts with the, with the government. Being in Marja, being in, in Dan, in Panjwe, in Helmand, in Kandahar, but also um, trying to see how institutional development can happen. So I work with the UN, work with the Human Rights Commission, with ICRC, with many institutions outside and inside the government. Um, you talked about the harsh reality with passion, but with more clarity, which is absolutely needed when it comes to how aid can be affected and contribution of the international community to how Oxfam was putting yesterday when I was talking with them, amplifying the change. What you haven't talked is the new narrative of the country. There's another reality which of a generation that comes up 
that's positive, that's committed, that's trying to move between these extremes, trying to be continuously making efforts to build a new future. Um, there's a suicide attack every, every morning in the street, but you have a kid going passing the same street going to school. She says no, and, and that, the narrative has not been communicated enough. Um, which I, I do know the legacy of particularly Canadians in Kandahar has not been looked at after 2011. There wasn't that much of women in prevention council which you have now. I give you one last, um, as an example. Um, in 2010, when the military and civilian search started, I was in Kandahar talking with the youth. The first question I had was, what they need? They mostly talked about roads, you know, infrastructure, buildings. But in 2014, during the transition process, when we're moving with the transition of PRTs, looking at what it was created as a need phase, what it turned into conflict phase, when transition, post-transition, and looking to the, to the model, when I talked to the youths, we talked about transition of economy, transition of politically and, and security, <coughs> Asking the same you what they need. They talked about education. They talked about democracy. So there was a change of perception. And that perception, that change has not been enough communicated strategically. And that's the case even in Canada, that's the case in the US, that's the case in many countries, and even for us in Afghanistan. So, John, I, I, as someone who you left and you then, you know, deeply involved in, in an, uh, make analysis of, of the situation, good or bad, and, and that process of input, you know, uh, output, output and outcome. How do you see the new narrative? What is that another colorful picture of the country that has to be communicated to international communities? Yeah. Contribution <clears throat> has not been gone in vain and has contributed to a building of new. I, I think you make good points. There is a lot of success. The Afghan people are resilient people, brave people. And there is a new generation. Uh, but my job is not to be a cheerleader. My job is not to do a travelogue of Afghanistan. I have a document, and I call it my uh, brief. And you, you here in the UK or Canada, you understand what a brief is. You know? 1978 IG Act, and the IG Act had created me. I'm supposed to ferret out fraud, waste, and abuse and make recommendations on improving our programs. I don't do policy, and I don't do that. I wish I could, but USAID has a billion dollar budget to do PR. The Department of Defense had more public relations people in Afghanistan than I had my whole agency. Okay? Uh, the Afghan government can do it. UN can do it, World Bank. There's a lot of people who can do that. They should do it. Because we're not hearing enough about the younger generation in Afghanistan. But that's my humble opinion. But it's not my job. This is where my job is. This is what I do. And, uh, but I think you're absolutely correct, sir. You know, I, I, I wish your country all the best. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Diane. John, that oh. would be the last question. Oh, last question. Okay, sorry. It's very I quick. It's long. actually just a follow-up on yeah. that. Um, and it's about lessons learned. Uh, I, I work in uh, global affairs Good. and working on evaluations all the time. It's important not only to identify areas of fraud and waste and so on, but also when there are successes, it's part of the lessons learned. What went right so we can replicate that or look at elements that we can be thinking about for the next yep. time? And and have, is there, I'd like yeah. to press you on that. Do you put that yeah. into Yeah, we put that. If you look at every one of our reports, we talk about success, too. Uh, we talk about where it worked, and we try to draw lessons from that. We talk about failure. There's been more failure than where it worked, but we always do that. When we issue <coughs> audits, and when we do our quarterly reports, we summarize. This is our quarterly report that comes out very hefty, too. We summarize what is significant that happened over the last quarter. I don't think you've got anybody up here who does this. So every quarter in Afghanistan, if you're interested in Afghanistan, because we do talk about things of interest to the Canadians, this comes out every quarter. Oh yeah, we read it. Yeah, I know you do. Uh, and I'm actually going to go there tomorrow to talk to you. Uh, but we do highlight the successes where we can. 
But again, my job is not to be a cheerleader. We've got enough cheerleaders in our government. Mendacity. Don't oversell. Okay? Uh, I'll let somebody else. Can, can I have one question? Please. All right. Yes, all right. Yes, so, I'm here. Yeah. You got to the different, part, um, the different countries that are part of the coalition. Oh, sorry. My name is Rosanne. I'm a student at the Graduate School of Public Health. Great, great. Um, and the different, so the different countries that are part of the coalition, or any country in the West that's doing stabilization in Afghanistan, define stabilization differently. And their effort, the stabilization efforts vary tremendously. Whether it's whole, whole government approach or their approaches differ. They have their own. Um, intergovernmental, um, let's say, problems. And do, do you think that the fact that there's no clarity across the, dep the dep government departments on what really stabilization activities are um, contributes to the lab, to the... Absolutely. To the you, you read our report. You don't have to do it. We could have hired you. See? Smart kid. Uh, <laughs> our whole, we start the stabilization report with, I don't think it's, what is stabilization? And it is defined. There's like 20 different definitions in the U.S. government law. And it is important. But stabilization, just real quickly, is that period of development that occurs after you kick the bad guys out and before really long-term development. So it's more time sensitive. And its main purpose, and only purpose, and we do a nice little example here, you build a bridge. Well, for development, you may build that bridge to do economic development long-term, et cetera, to connect the highways and all that. Stabilization, you build that bridge to try the help the local government be accepted by the locals in that district. So that's what that's how we define stabilization. With that, I wish I could. I'll be around. I know there's other things going, and I and, I, and I'm sorry that I'm stealing uh, your time. But thank you very much. Please read the reports. Please be active in your government, like we need to be active in our government. This is so critical, and I warn you, we will do it again. We got a 17 year laboratory experiment. We should learn from that experiment. Thank you. Thank you so much for a fascinating, interesting, and really uh, depressing talk. <laughs> but then again, that's not new. Uh, just, just one quick remark before we move on towards the second part of, of, of this session. So in a way, there is hope, John, because we teach at this university classes where we talk about input, output, and outcome. We also, in one of the classes, assign the cigar reports as required readings. Oh, so that hope was hope orders and all. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there is hope on that. And it's also great to have such a tremendous uh, turnout of, of, of people. Like that clearly shows me that there is an interest in, in, uh, in, in what we find in Britain. We have the second part of, of this morning, and that's a panel discussion. What we thought what would be uh, nice to, to, to go hand in hand with your uh, talk would be kind of the lessons learned of uh, Canadian experiences in not only Afghanistan, but in the in, in Frightened State. So we have three panelists. And I'm going to very briefly introduce yourself. Uh, introduce them. I start with Nika and Nika Banerjee, who basically made this uh, event possible. So thank you very much, Nika, for all your work. I could talk for 10 minutes about who Nika is. I'll make it very short. She's one of the very few people I know who goes just like a normal person to Kabul. Right? When we go to Kabul, we go in the planes and we are embedded and we have made the security of our car. Nika takes a plane gets out of the plane at the airport, takes a Corolla taxi, and talks to three people. So if you want to know something about Afghanistan, one of your first sources, I mean, there was the Afghans, but then it's just the Afghans. <laughs> this is so I learned a lot from her. She also has a, a, a massive, massive career in government with Tina and many other governments, and now she's uh, teaching here at our university and also at Carleton. Then you have a guest from Carleton, uh, Teddy Sammy, he is the, the director of uh, NIPSIA, as we speak now. NIPSIA is the, the, the well-known, uh, very, very prominent, and well, very excellent program on international affairs at Carleton University. Teddy is an economist, so he's the, the guy for the big picture, uh, the, the, the big data, interested in uh, development economics at the intersection of fragile states. 
And here we will be talking about uh, some uh, African countries, right? The, the experience of Mali, especially, are very, very, very good example. And then we have Stephen Bodani, a colleague of mine <coughs> at this university, but from the School of Development. Also one of the people who does both have an academic career and a background in, 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 in government and other uh, so he's a practitioner as well. He's, in, he's also very in the intersection of uh, development and security. And most of the work I know recently is about Haiti, right? So he's going to talk about Haiti, Nepal, Afghanistan, Haiti, about Mali, and uh, African countries. The idea is to give each panelist 15 minutes. And then we have re reactions by John. And then hopefully we have a, a, a few minutes left for a few and day. And with that, Nipa, you have the floor. And then I suggest with that, I guess, Penny, and then for 15 minutes. I will, uh, I will be strict with the time. So after 40 minutes, I start waving. I have time myself. <laughs> but what I'm going to do is to read from a script. I've got so much to say that if I started talking extempore, even with um, PowerPoint, I'd be all confused and would forget half the things. So what I will do, but I will read slowly so that everybody grasps it. Um, I cannot match John Sopko as a speaker, I tell you right now. <laughs> so don't expect that. Um, a lot of the things I will say today are based on my practical experience. I was in Afghanistan when our embassy opened up in 2003. I was asked to go at um, go for one year, and I said that I wasn't going to go for uh, one year because it's useless. I waste my time and money. So uh, I went for three years, um, and a lot of the things that I say it's a bit historical as to what happened from 2003, but that those many of the areas were not, were not cleared up that happened in those early years, you know, are continuing as John has pointed out. In 2003, a team merely of three Canadians with no representation from the Canadian government's intelligence unit, stepped into a complex and virtually unknown conflict scenario to start up Canada's operations in Afghanistan. Opening of an embassy with such a tiny staff complement in a country with insurmountable political, security, social, and economic problems reflected lack of understanding of the extent of complexities that needed attention. No strategic guidelines for programming and operation were articulated. The 3D strategy combining development, defense, and diplomacy existed only in theory. In 2001, Canada readily subscribed to the stated objective of the international community to stabilize Afghanistan through establishing a legitimate state with capacity to perform the core functions of governance and extend its authority across the country with support of its people. The state must have the ability to mobilize revenue and deliver the basic services, security and freedom from violence, access to food, water, basic health, education, and income. Provision of the required services would help the state to win the hearts and minds of the people and get their backing in preventing resurgence of violence and militancy. A violence-free Afghanistan would contribute to the maintenance of internal, regional, and international peace and security. Canada's stabilization agenda was to be guided by a whole-of-government approach, addressing defense and security, social economic development, and diplomacy and policy dialogue means with capacity building of Afghan state institutions at the center. 
The diplomacy element of Canada's treaties went amiss at the very start in 2001 at Bonn with the launch of a flawed peace-building process by the international community. Flawed because a reconciliation process with a major conflict group, the Taliban, that features high today in the international community's priority list, was not at the table in Bonn. Bonn also planned no coordinated program for developing capacity of the Afghan defense and security forces. Training for capacity building of the Afghan forces was prioritized much later, far too late, when the Taliban insurgency had grown strong and exit of the foreign troops were being planned. Today, there exists no evidence to support <clears throat> any claim that the belatedly put together NATO's advice, training, and assistance mission has effectively strengthened the Afghan defense and security forces. In an effort to promote security by winning the hearts and minds of local communities, Canada introduced community support-based civil military cooperation or CIMIC program. CIMIC comprised quick and visible, mostly small infrastructure projects of well digging, road repairs, equipment supplies, construction of culverts, fencing of school compounds, etc. Unfortunately, CIMIC program failed to earn the desired popular support for the government of Afghanistan because the government played no role in civic planning and implementation. Canadian soldiers, not the Afghan government, were in the front lines. Nor is any concrete evidence found of any of the benefits believed to have been showered on the local communities by, by sinning, and they had not been sustainable in the longer term. These hoped for quick impact projects, which I call tips, turned into NIPS, no impact projects, very well. <laughs> Early warnings on the growing failures of the very much needed security sector reform programs went unheeded. The security sector reform program aimed at reducing violence associated with local illegal militia groups, the ex-combatants, and proliferation of small arms and munitions. These high-cost reform programs fail to make contributions to security enhancement. They falter, first and foremost, due to unstrategic compromises and unholy alliances made by the Afghan government and members of the international community with local strong men who nurture private militia. Demobilization of the illegal armed groups never took off. Rather, rearmament became the order of the day. Corruption, for instance, with police salaries siphoned off, was detected early, but donors took no action. Most of the issues, design flaws, lack of proper management oversights and audits, crippling the security sector reform process, were within donors' management control and could have been attended to easily, but were ignored. The failure of the security sector reforms fed the insurgency and internal conflict. Canada's new impact project list is not short. I will cite only two representative projects. Canada supported pomegranate production as an alternative livelihood project to prevent farmers from growing poppy. The basic assumption was wrong. No crop, the least pomegranates, could compete with opium poppy prices. Counter-narcotics programming of Canada and the international community failed miserably. Afghanistan today is the largest narcotics producing country in the world. Taliban thrives on narcotics trade. A NIPS or no impact project that takes the prize was implemented by a Canadian non-governmental organization, IMPACTS. 
The intended objective of the project was to promote gender equality. It spent $4 million to create four women's radio stations. No reporting is found on the reach or of the programs transmitted and their effects. The project also published an English language newspaper for raising awareness of women to their rights and theirs when the vast majority of the women and girls were illiterate. A prime example of a project not appropriate for the conditions on the ground, the project's management costs were unusually high. In general, lessons that could have been learned from the formative years, the first half of the decade, following the expulsion of the Taliban, were not recorded, nor incorporated in planning of the follow-up phases of Canadian operations. These stand out as indicators of management inefficiency. A summative evaluation of Canada's development program in 2014 noted some of the indicators of management deficiency. The indicators list includes missing documents, including strategy documents, incomplete files, quick staff rotation, all resulting in loss of corporate memory. Further, the evaluation report mentions lack of baseline data for measuring changes, extreme risk-averse management, and extreme security restrictions for field and visiting headquarters staff, limited monitoring and oversight. Learning not only from the ill-implemented programs, but from those with positive results was missed. Canada's technical and financial support to Afghanistan's national mine clearance program was marked as successful unequivocally. A broad cut of funding of this program, especially withdrawal of technical support for capacity building in the Afghan government agency responsible for demining was unwise and erroneous. A provincial reconstruction team, PRT, under Canada's charge, operated in Kandahar from mid-2005 to 2011. PRT programming ignored the positive results of the Canadian-funded Afghan government design and led national programs, especially the National Solidarity Program, that promoted delivery of needed services through projects identified and implemented by rural communities. Programs of this nature were the central means of connecting people at subnational levels with the national government. They enhanced Afghan government's visibility and presence in the remotest corners of the provinces, earned popular support for the government, and thus contributed to building state legitimacy, the most essential ingredient for state stabilization. The process helped enhance Afghan state institutions' ability to design, plan, and deliver development programs to its people and increased Afghan officials' overall capacity in handling government affairs and finances essential for efficient functioning of any state. Unfortunately, failing to learn from the benefits to be derived from supporting Afghan-led programs, Canadian PRT shifted its attention to supporting a Canadian design and implemented Maple Leaf Stamped program, comprising six priorities and three signature projects in Kandahar. The priorities were diverse, were not systematically addressed, and not even fractional sustainable progress is discernible in most of these priority areas. The signature projects did not contribute to legitimacy building for the Afghan state. They operated in Kandahar as mechanisms parallel to those of the Afghan government, sidelining Afghan national government's efforts to connect with people. The so-called hearts and minds win, if any, from the signature projects 
would turn out to be for the protection of the Canadian forces, not for that kind of government. Since Canadian development finances were programmed and implemented by Canadian contracted agencies in Kandahar, with no involvement of the national government, Afghan institutions were denied the opportunities to develop capacities of their own to plan, implement, monitor, and act as accountable agencies. Canadian-owned signature projects that consumed a disproportionate amount of Canadian development funds also failed to produce any significant sustainable results for people's benefit. Notably, many of the Canada Finance National Programs, such as those in health and education sectors that Canada still supports, generated some positive results in the past, but are now registering deterior deteriorating performance. Is this the result of too much money spent too fast with little analysis and oversight? as John Sonko mentioned. The blast walls and endless checkpoints turning the capital city Kabul into a fortress, some say like a maximum security prison, do not certainly indicate that Canada and the international community as such is anywhere near reaching the original objective of consolidating Afghan state's legitimacy and its authority across the nation and creating an enabling environment for stabilization of Afghanistan. To conclude to the query, if the lessons in Afghanistan that we discussed today can be generalized and applied in other cases of international intervention in fragile post-conflict and in-conflict countries, my answer is yes, with in-depth research. Thanks everyone uh, for coming and thank you to the organizers and NEPA as well, of course, as a leader uh, with the Fragile States Research Network. Uh, it's always nice to come back to the University of Ottawa where I was a student many years ago um, uh, and I did some of that, some of my, of my education here. Uh, just in terms of background, I, I will not necessarily follow exactly uh, what John's approach or NEPA's approach uh, have been in terms of lessons learned, but what I want to do is talk a little bit about Mali in particular. Nipa had asked me to talk about the fragile states of Africa, but it quickly dawned on me that in 15 minutes it would not be a good idea <laughs> to talk about fragile states of Africa because one of the things, if there is something that we've learned in this very complicated literature, including debates about what fragility itself means or doesn't mean, just like in the case of stabilization, is that no country is fragile in the same way. And, and I think this is one thing that I want to start with. Because in one of the uh, comments or questions that I was asked to, to look at is, are there lessons learned? So I would say, let's be very careful about, about applying lessons learned from one place to another until we're pretty confident that the same situation is going to present itself to us. Having said that, I think Mali does have some similar characteristics with other fragile states, including Afghanistan. Uh, it's one of the few low-income countries that remain in the world. If you look at the World Bank classification, there's about 30, 31 low-income countries now. Mali is one of them with Afghanistan. And a few others, it's landlocked. It's surrounded by many countries. Uh, it's twice the size of France, roughly, so it's a pretty big country. Uh, there's lots of poverty in Mali, despite the fact that the country has grown at reasonable rates in the last few years, uh, average five, sometimes even higher than five percent. Per capita growth is a little bit lower because of increasing very high population growth rates. Uh, a lot of young people, uh, which is also the case in many African countries today, 
And, and one of the challenges that many of these countries will face in the future is employment creation and where do you, how do you create jobs for the young people who now uh, will be joining uh, the job market in the future. Uh, it's a very low human development country. If you look at the profile of Mali in terms of a human development index, it's at the, almost the very bottom of that index together with Afghanistan. Uh, and if you add to that high inequality and gender inequality, the picture is even worse. So that gives you a sense of where this country is. It has made a lot of progress. I mean, even if you look at long-term trends in human development, you see changes. But it still faces a number of challenges. Uh, Mali is also interesting from a Canadian perspective because it has been a long Canadian development partner. Canada has been providing aid to Mali for decades. In fact, we are one of the biggest donors bilaterally in that country. Uh, we have a strong presence. In recent years, we've donated in excess of $100 million every year to Mali as part of our development programming. And of course, as most of you know, Canada recently deployed uh, a stabilization, quote unquote, mission to Mali uh, this year. It's a very modest mission for a very short period of time. Um, I think a lot of people have have warned that maybe this is something that could lead into another Afghanistan, and I think we have to keep that in mind. Some people have even argued that there's no peace to keep in Mali. Why are we sending peacekeeping missions? Uh, so there's, I think, a lot of interesting things happening from a Canada Canadian perspective to have us focus on this particular case. The reason I also chose Mali is because I just recently finished a book with a colleague of mine at Carlton, David Carm, and him and I, we've worked on fragile states for a long period of time, and as Christopher pointed out, we look at the big picture, we look at macro data, but we also look at qualitative information and try to combine it with events on the ground to basically provide a risk profile of countries around the world. I would suggest that you take a look at the country indicators for foreign policy project at Carlton, which has been funded by the Canadian government over the years and other, uh, um, other funding agencies and we try to update the, the data on a regular basis. So there are other people who do this kind of work. Uh, pro probably many of you know the Fragile States Index, which used to be known as the Failed States Index. I, I noticed John used the word failed in, in, in his remarks earlier. Uh, I think the literature has slowly moved away from that terminology. I mean, yes, there are probably a couple of countries that have failed, but most people tend to use Fragile. And if there's another point that I also want to make, and, and if there is such a thing as a consensus in that literature, I think what we're seeing now is a consensus towards the recognition that fragility is multidimensional. So that goes back to the point of looking at different aspects of a particular country. The OECD, in, in one of its latest reports, is adopting this methodology now where they're using uh, the multidimensionality of fragility to look at different aspects of each country. So this is what we also have preached for a long period of time, so we're glad to see that others are actually adopting this approach. Why Mali? Mali is a bit of a unique case. Uh, in the book that I just finished writing, we actually categorized countries into three groups. So we looked at countries that are trapped, so Afghanistan would be one of them, uh, the DRC, Yemen, and a few others are what we would consider countries that have been trapped in fragility, so they've been stuck for a very long period of time. And it doesn't look very good for most of them. It will take decades or even more for them to get out if we follow the historical trends. And then we have a few countries that we qualify as stabilized, so countries that have been able to uh, build resilience, uh, get out of the top 40 or 50 so-called fragile countries over time, and that are now on a path to you know, uh, resilience and don't seem to be falling back into fragility. Examples would include Bangladesh, Mozambique, Guatemala, uh, countries, for example, Bangladesh, Mozambique have not had a recurrence of civil war in the same sense as we've seen 15, 20 years ago, so they've been able to move out. Mali is in between. Uh, it's what we would call a country that moves in and out. So it's a country that appears in certain periods to be able to build resilience, but it doesn't take very long. All of a sudden you see things happen, as we've seen in 2012, and it goes back. Uh, so they are neither trapped nor exited. They are affected by environmental impacts and regional volatility, and because they are landlocked, they depend on their neighbors for immediate prosperity. So Mali is one of those, former British col uh, French colony, very aid-dependent country, 
which brings back what John argued earlier about the whole issue about sortive capacity and aid dependency. Mali has been aid dependent for as long as it's existed as an independent country. Uh, at one point, when elections were held in the 1990s, people thought that this was actually a good example in the African context of democracy. Uh, what we argue actually in, in the chapter where we look at Mali is that Mali has never been such a model, but we should not have thought of it as a country that was actually a model to follow. Uh, in fact, what we argue in the chapter is that the recent conflict that we've seen in 2012 is actually the rule rather than the exception. It's a country that continually exits and then re-enters it further down the road. So that's one thing that, that I would say. Uh, about this country. In fact, we describe it in the book uh, as Mali's fragility roller coaster. Uh, you've seen three major armed conflicts in the northern region. Um, it, it has been and has remained an aid darling uh, in the process of, of, of these, uh, as a result of these coups. Uh, the coup against President Toure undermine these assumptions even more uh, because we had a major secessionist conflict. Uh, and what's interesting is that conflict, if you go back to the roots of it, it has its roots in a 2006 uh, insurgency that detached the northern provinces, the three northern provinces from government control, and led to the occupation by Islamist groups, including uh, those connected to Al-Qaeda. So what you see again is one of these classic <coughs> problems that we deal with in fragile countries is the fact that the central government has no control over the authority, cannot guarantee security across uh, the region, uh, the borders are not secured. And as a result of this, we see major military intervention by France, followed by the UN mission, uh, which has enabled the country to regain partial control in the north. Um, what we notice if we look at this over the long term is that what actually tilts the country over the edge and throws it into extreme fragility is always challenges to authority. Because capacity is always weak. You look at the trend over time, if you look at the data, whether it's growth or poverty or human development, it is not a country that has had very strong capacity over time. Despite the fact that it's growing and that it receives a, a, long, uh, a lot of aid. The other thing that you also see in, in, in the case of Mali is that elite decisions and poor leadership have prevented it from actually recovering from fragility. Each time there's a destabilizing event, capacity gets worse and worse because of poor leadership and elite decisions that actually undermine what the country is trying to achieve. The country has been in and out at least four times in our data. There's no improvement that we see in the last few years, at least since 2012, the situation has deteriorated. Uh, and I'm not gonna focus on the historical uh, point, but I think what, what matters the most is, the, is what happened since, since 2012, uh, where we again see a challenge to the authority structure in that country, as I said before, partly because of ineffective control of territory and people. As an economist, I also focus much more on capacity, which is always interesting to me. It's, a, it's an interesting case because it's growing. Uh, I think we, I was asked to talk a little bit about the capacity of a country. We did some work on taxation, which, as you know, is a very important aspect of state building, if we agree on what state building is. So economists tend to look at state building in the form of taxation because it creates a fiscal bond between people and the government <coughs> that, that govern them. Uh, because if you're paying taxes, there's mutual accountability between you and your government. Interestingly, Mali makes a lot of effort to calculate, to collect taxes. Uh, we've looked at the data on this and calculated the tax effort. They actually exceed many countries in that region. The problem, however, is a structural problem. Mali is heavily dependent on agriculture and the informal sector. So unlike resource-rich countries, which tend to be disincentivized to collect taxes, Mali makes a lot of effort, but it hits a point where it cannot collect anymore because the, the country itself is structurally largely informal, relying on agriculture, so there's a limit to how much it can collect. Can we do better as donors in terms of doing this? Perhaps, because I think the data that we have shows that donors rarely invest in taxation systems. They invest a very small fraction of aid money into building effective taxation uh, systems that can allow countries to become 
less reliant on aid and more reliant on domestic resources. So that's one thing that I thought was interesting when I looked uh, at this case. Uh, the third leg, so when, when we think about fragility in our methodology, we look at authority, which is the control of territory. We look at capacity, the ability to provide goods and services to people. So I've, I've argued already that authority is something that continually brings that country into extreme fragility. Capacity is always poor. Surprisingly, legitimacy is actually the better of the, of the three. Uh, this is very different from a case such as Afghanistan, where the red lights are everywhere, usually. So you see the country doing very poorly across all dimensions. Mali, surprisingly, does relatively better on legitimacy scores than, than a country such as Afghanistan. Uh, so it's consist consistently better at, at having a legitimate government over the long term, but it's still fairly close to where the country is in terms of fragility. And then when you have these challenges, then legitimacy gets, gets worse. Um, so what does that say about what we know in terms of, of drivers? Uh, I've talked about challenges to authority. What we've also seen in the case of Mali is, ex is what is known now in the literature as isomorphic mimicry, where basically what elites do is that they take on the trappings of Western institutions to, in order to attract more aid. So they pretend they are making changes. And donors and other Western partners immediately fall for it. But what they end up failing to do as leaders of their country is to actually incorporate and develop fundamental institutional capacity to distribute social goods. So, so it, it's what people now have qualified as, as pretending to do something in order to attract money uh, and trying to do too much too soon at the same time. So they promise a lot, but they do not deliver on what they are trying to do. Uh, the other drivers that we've also looked at uh, in the case of Mali is identity manipulation. Uh, normally, you would expect a resident country to be able to manage reforms with international support. However, one thing over which donors have had little control over in the case of Mali is elite manipulation of regional identities. So they were never able to really get around this issue. And as a result, you have what now is a north-south conflict where you have rebels in the north who are trying to secede from the country. So this, this kind of elite manipulation is something else that, that donors have not been able to, to address. And the third driver, which I think John has touched upon, is the rent economy. So this is a country uh, that is, uh, where the rent economy is largely driven by development assistance. And in many cases, as in the case of Afghanistan that was presented earlier, that development assistance has lacked oversight and enforcement. Uh, while Mali has seen some success in terms of GDP growth, uh, there were also very steep losses. So it's ebbs and flows. In some years, you will have positive growth. In other years, you will have negative growth. And this seems to be the long-term pattern in this country. So you would have gains in one year and then contractions in the next, in part because the elites and the governments have failed to actually privatize the economy and at the same time, what they've basically done is weaken the public sector. So there's a lack of capacity in the public sector and a private sector that's had, that has a hard time to, uh, to develop itself. So that's, in a way, some of the things that I wanted to, to talk about when it comes to Mali. I think I, I want to conclude by going back to this issue of you know, being landlocked, surrounded by regional instability, and being unable, essentially, to control your territory and borders is, I think, a lesson that we need to learn as, as international partners. Because if we are very serious about investing in development in Mali, whether it's through education, or health, or now we have a feminist international assistance policy, which I think will, will focus a lot more attention on issues of gender, uh, what I think fundamentally we need to figure out first of all is how do we make sure that a country like Mali or Afghanistan perhaps has control over its territory and borders? Because I think, and I'm not necessarily, any, uh, no, I don't know Afghanistan as well as perhaps John or Nipa and others know Afghanistan, but at least anecdotally I know a lot of people have said that it's often the case that the central government has no control beyond capital. And I think in the case of Mali, you see the same problem. It is a country that fundamentally cannot control its borders. And because of the destabilization that has happened as a result of Libya and other countries, now we see that instability actually going into Mali because of a, 
uh, arms trade and, and re the return of rebels who used to fight uh, in the Qaddafi regime who have now come to the country and completely destabilized it. Um, I actually took a stab, and that will be my final comment, at thinking about what is the Canadian government doing in terms of development assistance in Mali, and, and what does that tell me about whether we should do anything different. So I went and looked at Global Affairs Canada, their website and their projects and the kinds of things that they do. You see a lot there. You see a lot of things about economic growth, uh, you know, education, governance, uh, a bit of everything. Uh, what is not clear to me, and I think this is where we, I think, and, and, and others need to have a, a discussion about this, is what is it that this country needs fundamentally, right? What are the priorities? Is it first and foremost securing the country and then thinking about development? Is it working across different levels of government to, to make everything happen? Should we think more and more about the timing and the sequencing of policies in a country like Mali? Should we not for example, focus a lot more on making sure that authority structures are first and foremost built in order to withstand the shocks, and then think about what to do in terms of capacity. Or let me put the question differently and end on that note. Is it possible that the reason why Mali has not developed is not so much because it hasn't been able to use aid effectively, but because of the authority challenges that it continually faces that brings it back into extreme forms of fragility. So it doesn't matter in a way at how much aid you're going to spend in that country, but until and unless you have a stable environment, you're not going to see the kind of development over the long term that, that we want to see. So I will stop here and I'll be happy to take questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers and particularly to NEPA for uh, convening us once again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sabko and the team from CIGAR uh, for joining us in this uh, really sharing your ongoing work, quite critical, very lucid work on uh, the limits or contradictions of U.S. in particular engagement in Afghanistan. And, and thanks to you all. Uh, so we have uh, uh, started tra to transition from Afghanistan uh, in Central Asia to uh, Mali in uh, Western Africa. I would like to take us across the Atlantic and uh, give you a, a glance of Haiti and what Canada has been doing in Haiti in order to uh, hopefully give us uh, at least three sort of data points, if you will, on which we might uh, at least uh, consider some contingent generalizations. So the frame of reference for my comments, the fundamental question is what does the evidence suggest about the extent to which Canada is actually contributing to the reduction of fragility, multidimensional fragility in Haiti? And uh, so what I'm assuming uh, is that this is not just about, it's never been for Haiti or for Canadians, for others, it's just about building state capacity, I authority, legitimacy capacity of a state as a formal institution, uh, but it's been about trying to contribute to the much larger challenge of uh, diminishing multi-dimensional fragility as uh, codified in that idea. It's not just about ALC. We've got to move from focusing on state institutions to uh, looking at state society relations, uh, including economic fundamentals and, and uh, political inclusion and so on. It's codified in the New Deal signed by 20 fragile states, including Afghanistan and Haiti, but not Mali in 2011, and northern donors. This is not just my idea, it's not just because I, I, I'm critical of the ALC focus uh, in 2018, but that because international norms have changed in 10 years, uh, and uh, that reflects some learning, uh, and uh, I think that our work really has to, uh, has to catch up. Full disclosure, I do some work with Global Affairs Canada, I collaborate with their evaluation unit, I have so over the years, and I also get funding for a rule of law project in Haiti right now, 
hopefully I can convince you by the end of my 15 minutes uh, that that has not dulled my capacity for independent analysis, but uh, you can be the judge. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Haiti. I'm going to talk mostly about what Canada's been doing, but uh, to understand what Canada's been uh, doing there and the results, uh, we really have to understand a little bit more about the context. For those of you who are not uh, Haiti experts, uh, it's important to recognize first that uh, Haiti's society of 11 million people uh, in living on the western half of Hispaniola Island in the Northern Caribbean, which despite a very honorable tradition of anti-colonial struggle, it was the first independent black republic in, in Haiti uh, in, in, in the Americas uh, in, uh, in 1804. So despite that, that uh, very, very uh, important uh, tradition, it's now ranked 12th at the, from the top uh, of the uh, Fragile States Index that, that, that uh, my colleague Teddy re referred to. So that means it has a score of about 102 out of the 120 maximum for total fragility across all uh, dimensions. Uh, compared to Afghanistan, which is actually ninth now on that index, South Sudan, which is first, has a score of 113.4 out of 120. Uh, so, 12 uh, most fragile states uh, according to that index. Uh, I also do recommend that uh, you triangulate this data if you're interested with other indices out there, including uh, the country foreign policy indicators uh, indices run by uh, Teddy and David Kerment, uh, because none of these indices are, are, are foolproof uh, and uh, it's important to have a more composite or comparative picture. Anyways, this multidimensional fragility, what is it, uh, what is it concretely about in Haiti? It's uh, first about historically rooted unstable governance and uh, social conflict, social conflict, not war. Uh, it's that those conflicts are linked to enduring inequalities, to uh, extreme poverty, weak macroeconomic growth, and weak public institutions, uh, as well as external dependence, particularly in the economic realm, uh, and uh, quite extreme environmental vulnerability uh, uh, manifested, of course, in, in recurring hurricanes, uh, but also in the uh, tragic, the devastating earthquake of January 2010. Yet, Haiti does have some advantages and it, and it has registered some important advances in recent years. It was actually ranked fifth from the top of the Fragile States Index in 2011, so just after the earthquake. Uh, and uh, it, uh, so it, there have been some improvements, and we'll talk more about that later. And we will, actually, in relation to uh, the results of Canadian assistance in several sectors. It is not a war. Now that condition of not being at war, now war is the spectrum and so are this violence, we know that, but that characteristic makes it so different from Afghanistan. Many things make it different from Afghanistan. It's an island, the other's landlocked, it's cut, so on and so forth. But this, the fact that there is no mid-intensity uh, conflict going on, it's a real game changer change in the parameters, I would argue, and it makes certain things possible in the Afghan context that I could say not possible in the, in, sorry, in the Haitian context, not being possible in the Afghanistan context, and I would say maybe not possible in, in, in the Malian context too. We'll come back to that. Okay? So it has had some relatively free and fair elections, uh, certainly the last round, 2016-2017, though not flawless, obviously. And it has some promising public policies in certain sectors. I'm going to flag policies in the area of public security and gender equality as uh, for illustrative purposes. Okay, so in that context, uh, what has Canada been doing? Uh, Can Canadian uh, cooperation, which receives whole of government uh, uh, cooperation across a number of sectors, has been very much framed or, or it's sort of yeah, framed within um, uh, the uh, United Security Council approved mandates for uh, successive UN missions, MINUSTA, for, <clears throat> from 2004 to uh, 2017, now MINUJUST, and also framed 
uh, under the umbrella of uh, the policy guidance and let's say conditionality uh, coming from the international financial institutions in, in Paris and, and in Washington. So that's the outer frame. It's also been informed by decades of Canadian involvement uh, in Haiti, similar to Haiti and uh, Mali in that regard, but fundamentally different from Canada's uh, position in Afghanistan in 2002-2003 when they sent Nipa and two other folks to uh, open, open our first post there, right, in Kabul. Um, so uh, we're net, we were not starting from scratch in 2004, uh, and, uh, and that, that knowledge of the environment and the actors and the institutions and the history and the relationships has is, is really uh, been crucial. So uh, <clears throat> based on those fundamentals, if you will, Canada has provided about $100 million Canadian a year uh, to and uh, cooperation uh, to Haiti. It's over 200 million after the earthquake, but it's averaged 100 million dollars a year from 2004, covering a range of sectors: humanitarian assistance (HA), uh, social development, particularly health and education, uh, security, public security, uh, gender equality, and ENR, so natural resources and environment, being cross-cutting uh, priorities. And finally, as I mentioned, the approach from the outset from 2004 that uh, was always a long-term approach. This is Kansas. Nobody was under the illusion in Ottawa that this would be fast. Uh, uh, and uh, so there were multi-annual commitments. Kind of one of the first donors that was, you know, putting multi-annual commitments on the table from 2004 and actually delivering the highest percentage of delivery of our promises than any other donor, any other major donor. So I'm a little bit proud of that. You can tell as a Canadian, it doesn't mean that our cooperation has been perfect or that it's had stellar results. So let's talk a little bit about that too. Okay, so again, uh, if we have way more time, I'd like to cover more sectors or problem areas, but I'm gonna, I've picked out gender equality, promotion of gender equality and public security because they're priorities for the Haitians, support for their priorities for the Canadians, and they're, total, they're very different uh, but connected areas. So I'm, I picked these out for illustrative purposes. Okay, now in Canada, sadly, we do not have CIGAR. We do not have a CIGAR equivalent. I am, once again, John, so jealous. <laughs> you just see the quality of this work, seriousness, uh, and, and so on. <clears throat> now, but this is Canada, so we do things on small budgets. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the bilateral cooperation in Haiti has been uh, evaluated. Uh, the last official evaluation uh, was published in 2015, and it uh, indicated that Canada had made core contributions to the elaboration of adoption uh, and adoption of the equality between men and women or gender equality policy in the action plan in 2004. So that's a very significant. Welcome to look at those plans on the website of the Ministry of Women's Conditions and Rights in, in Haiti. Uh, it's in French, uh, um, uh, and uh, it's quite, you know, comprehensive. It's an approach, pr profoundly far-reaching in the kind of reforms that it not only envisages, but it actually, the government commits itself to over the next 25 years. Uh, the evaluation also uh, documents Canada's uh, significant contributions to decrease the maternal and infant mortality on the basis of the MNCH program and as well as to increase girls' attendance and retention in elementary school. Okay, in addition, our own research uh, suggests that, though, that the evaluation, first of all, was quite uh, methodologically rigorous, though it lacked robust baseline data in some areas, uh, and that its conclusions, conclusions are generally sound, though it could have been more critical of uh, weak Canadian investment in Haitian national institutions in particular, which is really crucial for the sustainability of development and security results over the long run. So let's hang on to that next picture. Uh, we can come back to, to uh, gender cooperation in this area and what the official evaluations and the academic research tell us. But let me um, give you a snapshot of what cooperation look like and the results of cooperation look like in a very different so with regards to public security, 
uh, Global Affairs Canada's evaluations uh, in more recent years, uh, being evaluated START program or the program funded under the Stabilization and Reconstruction Task Force, uh, which is the predecessor of the Peace and Stability Operations Program and Global Affairs, complicated alphabet soup. Uh, but anyway, so programmed in Haiti for many years, and so the evaluation of that and the CPA, which is the Canadian Police Arrangement, multi-annual deployment. Haiti was the largest recipient of Canadian police for uh, 15 years compared to any other country in the world. So these are important programs, important evaluations. What they suggest, and, and then one project evaluation, what they suggest first is that Canada has contributed significantly to professionalizing the national police. There's no army. Well, the army is being rebuilt slowly. It's a whole other set of issues. But police is still the major uh, security providing in a public institution in, in Haiti. So it's a really important fulcrum for uh, security sector reform and rule of law uh, in the country. Uh, so all the um, Canadian assistance, both through the UN, through the MINUSA mission, and bilateral through the FIPCA project. FIPCA is basically a middle level training, professional development program aimed at middle level countries in the police that's been run through the Haitian <coughs> National Academy. It was the first time Canada said, well, Haiti's had, you know, sent its officers all over the world to train and they come back in different, with different doctrines, different standard operating procedures, and they can't work together. Surprise, surprise. And so Canada said, okay, we're going to break, help you break the cycle. We are going to help you actually um, uh, revamp your a national police academy and we're going to help you design the curriculum and set it all up, train your trainers and so on. That has actually happened and the evaluations show that that has brought some important results. Uh, including down the road helping to increase public confidence in the national police and there's repeated public opinion surveys that show that. It's important data and maintaining crime rates at a stable level and relatively low level in regional terms that you wouldn't know that if you only read the headlines. Okay, now our research goes a bit further though. It, it shows that those gains are very real, but they're still fragile because they coexist with the collective. And by collective, I don't only mean we internationals. That means Asians and international partners. Collective inability to foster deep reforms in the national police itself, not to mention the, pris the prisons, uh, and not to mention the judiciary, which has uh, hardly uh, changed at all. And it coexists with the inability to actually contribute to wider economic, political, social, cultural constraints that greatly affect reform. So for example, it has Canada, despite all of its investment in the U.S. and so on, the European Union uh, have really not made a dent in the unemployment and underemployment problems there, in fact, the youth under unemployment problems, which actually fuel violence, reduce that uh, social violence in Haiti to youth unemployment, but they certainly feed that, and until we attend to that too, we get the best police force in the world, all it's going to do is put more young people, and poor people in particular, in So, why? Okay, this is a long, requires a lot of discussion, but let me try to boil this analysis, a lot of scholarly research on this, in this case, uh, uh, by myself and by others, down to three sets of factors. First, in response to the, our chair's questions, uh, I would argue that Part of the reason why there have been some good results of Canadian cooperation in these sectors and in some others uh, is that Canadian programming, as well as its monitoring and evaluation, has actually been fairly appropriate, fairly well designed, fairly well conducted, and particularly with its attention to long-term engagement, uh, has been able to learn. Canadians have learned, sometimes with Haitian counterparts, and they have adapted their programs, sometimes in smart ways along the way, and that's reflected in results in certain, certain areas. And that's despite some backsliding and blind spots also, which I'd be happy to come back to in Tuesdays. The second um, uh, 
set of positive factors is that our programming has aligned with uh, broader multilateral pro, uh, priorities, not just U.S. Very different. U.S. has huge influence in Haiti. Obviously, it's a neighbor. It's a but reconstruction effort takes place in pretty clearly defined multilateral frameworks. UN, IMF, World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, and so in the U.S. has a lot of influence in there, but it doesn't run the show. Again, I think that's substantially different than some other uh, cases that we're looking at today. One Okay, so, but the second thing is it's not just about alignment with international partners. It's and multilateral uh, coordinating uh, mechanisms and priorities. It's also, and more importantly, about alignment sometimes in these sectors and others with national priorities carried by somewhat capable national institutions, including sometimes in the executive, certainly in the police, certainly in the Ministry of Women's Condition and the Women's Movement in Haiti. Not perfect institutions. There are corruption issues there, too. We could come back to them. But we do not need to run the show. It is a sovereign country that has some capacity and political will for reform in certain areas. We can come back to that. However, that's where the good news ends. Uh, because enduring contextual constraints from very serious national fiscal crises underpinned by very weak uh, economic, uh, macroeconomic growth. Very unstable governance and elite irresponsibility, similar to some of these other, ca the other cases we've been looking at today. Ranging all the way to patriarchal norms and the relations of power. And so I'm just trying to span a spectrum of kind of you know, institutional and macro-societal constraints, uh, as well as finally, last but not least, mixed, mixed US, uh, agendas. Mixed U.S. agendas, mixed U.N. agendas, it's not all coherent. Even mixed agendas for large South-South uh, cooperation, players in South co cooperation like Brazil, uh, and Venezuela and Ecuador, which have supported, for example, the reestablishment of the Haitian army, which the state cannot pay for because it cannot even pay for its police, despite the reluctance of or the over the objections of the U.S. and Canada, the Western Europeans, and so on. It's a very complex picture, um, and uh, a lot, there are a lot of uh, uh, contradictions. Anyway, so let me get to this last question about generalization is in many ways the toughest one for all of us. So what? What can we learn from you? Well, like Teddy, I'm very careful about, I think it's very unwise, in fact it's totally unwise to generalize from any case, any kind of social science inquiry, right? You can't extrapolate from one data point. Right? Uh, but I think that we can situate each case in a larger panorama. Right? And I really liked the way Teddy and David I've forgotten, so thanks for reminding me, Teddy, the group different created this you know, categorization of different states of fragility and conflict from trapped to uh, consolidated, how can we come out of fragility, if you will. Right? Um, so my own sense, I'd like to start with this the first kind of takeaway that I, I, I'd like you to uh, consider from, from this in terms of things that may be applicable beyond Haiti is that uh, this, the somewhat positive results of Canada-Haiti cooperation uh, over the past 15 years confirm the enduring relevance of the OECD Development Assistance Committee's Fragile States Principles. Some of you may have forgotten about them. They were adopted in 2007. Well, I think they actually have some kernels of wisdom uh, such as taking context the starting point, so banal it seems obvious, but actually isn't always done, as we've heard, right, from our, our speakers, isn't done properly, in taking truly integrated whole of government or comprehensive approaches, uh, making strengthening the state and its relationships and accountability to society priority, acting fast, staying engaged for the long run, so those are four of the 
uh, 10 fragile states principles. Go back and look at them. I think they remain relevant. They're embedded in the New Deal also, uh, and uh, in, in fact, in the SDGs, especially SDG 16. So this case suggests that Ottawa can actually apply those principles and other principles that reflect decades of learning partened by failure uh, in, but where? Where? In relatively permissive contexts where somewhat positive national conditions, will and capacity, and international priorities align. Even there, so I'm saying even there, in relatively permissive environments, remember he is not at war and so on and so forth. Right? It is really difficult. And deep reforms, deep institutional reforms, state capacity building, huh? not to mention larger economic, social uh, reforms, remain tenuous, which seems even more the case in less permissive or highly restrictive contexts. Sudan, like Afghanistan, and sure about Mali, we can come back to that, which leaves me anyways, and I think it should leave you with really, really tough questions about what is possible to accomplish in those, in those environments. I just say that I really like Mr. Sokko's one of the conclusions, which is, it's not that we can't help do anything or help them do anything, just that our goals have to be a lot more modest and maybe less money, but actually be more effective if it's properly embedded and grounded and so on, and learn from what we So it's my shot at contingent generalization. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. <laughs> we give the floor back to John for some comments on these three Presentations. Can I just sit here? And... Yeah, sure. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, all the presentations were fantastic. So, oh, it might be a oh for the camera. For a bit to see the I, I just well, let me say it again. I, I thought that all the presentations were fantastic and real fuel for thought. And I want to uh, pivot if I can off of the. Uh, last uh, speaker and the statement you made about uh, uh, maybe a little less why it better done. I think that's a common thing. I mean, you know, smaller may be better. That's one of the things that come out. And I really do love relatively permissive environment. Remember we talked about security and uh, Nipa was talking about that. Uh, national conditions and the international communities' priorities combined. I think that's a key too, and that sounds like maybe a key in mind. I think mean, that's fascinating. So let, let me just say one thing. I know we can't and, and, and we can't extrapolate from one country or one experience, because every country is different, I agree with that. But what I'm faced with, and I think you are too, is uh, Governmental Affairs Canada, like USAID, like the Department of Defense and the Ministry of Defense, <coughs> are going to ask the question that was asked to me, so what? They're looking for operational advice. And I think you've got to keep that in mind. And I think you're getting there with those things, and I think in Mali. But that's where you, the rubber really meets the road when you're an academic or an auditor like me. They'll say, so what does it mean? What's, I need actionable items. I'm about ready to send troops in the ground or approach Parliament with a billion dollar or a million dollar budget. What does it mean? What should I ask for? What do you give me some advice? And I think that's one of the things I think many government officials say, Nipa, what, what do you want me to do? I mean, you wrote a great report, a great book. I have to turn that into something practical. And I think that's fantastic because I think you've given us some food for thought and government food for thought on that. So I just want to throw that out. I really did like the control of borders issue because that's something in common, I think, with Afghanistan and Mali and I think a lot of the other countries where you see fragile, I use the term failed, I'm old school, but it's fragile states. 
They can't control their borders. And that's a key. I think for those of you in the military or have looked at counterterrorism policies, they say you can't win in a counterinsurgency if the country can't control its borders. You're going to lose. And any success we've had in counterinsurgency is a where a country has been able to control their borders. I throw that out for thought. I'm not a counterinsurgency expert, but far more smarter people than me, but I think that's important. The one thing NEPA talked about, and it's, it, what, what is interesting is how much of what we all said is in common. There's a common thread. And actually, to many of you, probably my presentation was pretty boring, because you, you knew it. You know, security is important, all of that. I, I would draw, and NEPA, you know, we both, it was very sympath, uh, symbiotic, or sympath, sympathetic, I should say, not symbiotic, sympathetic. We were all talking about the same thing. I would draw that distinction between NEPA and me and all the other speakers is I'm like that uh, Government Affairs Canada report. It's official. The government has put their imprimatur. And so keep that in mind. That actually does help. Uh, they have a government official do that. Which brings me to the other thing, oversight. And we didn't really hear too much from Mahler. Uh, you know better than I about it, but how important was the role of oversight, or should be the role of oversight, and how effective is oversight, not just by the government of Mali, but by the international donors. And the other issue none of us have talked to, except I think Nipa and I have, because of our experience in Afghanistan is conditionality. I didn't hear anybody talk about that. The international donors, as Government Affairs Canada, as the U.S., done conditionality. And I'm a firm believer in conditionality. Uh, and maybe I'm harping uh, to an audience that, again, says it's so <coughs> But it is really important. It's your money. You're a Canadian. You're giving a Canadian dollar to the Mali government or to the people of Haiti. You have a right to know how it's being spent. And more importantly, you have a right to say, hey, if you're spending it for parties, or you're diverting all of it to uh, buying uh, places in Vancouver, I don't want you to spend my money on that. And that's called conditionality. And I keep reminding people, and I'd love to hear these other speakers talk about conditionality, I keep reminding uh, our State Department and DOD, and I said, look, you've got the upper hand. The government of Afghanistan will fail tomorrow if we walk away because of that delta. And I assume the same delta applies in Haiti. You alluded to it. And in Mali, how much money do they raise? Afghanistan raises $2.5 to $3 billion a year in revenue. Just to pay for their police and defense department is $4 to $6 billion. See the delta? To pay for the rest of the government we've given, the civil service salaries, everything else, there's another four to six billion. Who's paying that? Who's making the difference? It's the donors. So can't the donors demand some accountability? I just throw that out. Again, I'm just a simple country lawyer from Ohio. You know? uh, speaks kind of funny. But I think that's something, and that's sort of caught on with our Congress. About conditionality. Remember, in Afghanistan, we didn't start, the Department of Defense did not put a first condition on all the money. And the Department of Defense has spent $70 billion, about $126 billion, on the Afghan military and police. And they didn't put a condition on it until 2014. They haven't even lived it. So we have to be brave enough to say no. It's like you when you're raising your child. You have to be brave enough to tell the kid you ain't getting the, the car keys if you don't finish your homework. So we got to be brave enough to say no. And that's a problem. And, and Ghani, President Ghani, and, uh, in Afghanistan, I guess you say, and the uh, CEO of Doha say, put conditions on us. God damn it. We'll do it. And as a matter of fact, Ghani takes our report and Abdullah reads these things and then calls in ministers and say, hey, how come you're not doing what Sidra says? They use this stuff. So they'll use your report. They'll use your book. They should use the Government Affairs Canada report. A good government should use it to hold their own ministers accountable. 
So I throw that out. The last thing, sustainability. We should all talk about sustainability. And I think that's a common thread too. And Deepa talks about it in Afghanistan, but we talked about it. How, how sustainable is any of this if you walk away? And the last thing, if I didn't mention already, is I think you hit it on the head, the difference between Haiti and Mali and, and Afghanistan. You don't have a war going on. And God bless it, because then you're allowed to actually train the police. You're able to send policemen into an environment to train the police and go out and mentor and all that, because usually your OPP can't go into a hot zone. You know, you're gonna have to send your military. So I think you, you have, we had it lucky in Haiti, but the question is, Haiti's been sort of the basket case of Caribbean for years, and the overall thing is, it puts out its outcome. The outcome has not been good. I know they've been dealt a bad set of cards with the, the, the weather and uh, the earthquake and all that. But geez, after all these years, you would think, what's what's the outcome? Lastly, is Haiti is not under time constraint, and it doesn't sound like Mali is either. You don't have any unreasonable timelines given by the donors, which is probably good too. So anyway, I spoke too much. But anyway, I thought it was fantastic. I really learned a lot from the pre presentation. Thank you so much. We are uh, running out of time. I think the time was to end at 11.45, so it is past 11.45. So with that, I want to thank John, his team, the panelists, Nipa, Kelly, and Steve. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting, inspiring morning. And thank you for coming. Um. I mean, we can do it. Can we can do it. Yeah. 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 Sure. I feel so bad cutting these guys yeah. off. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's start with it. So we, then we have uh, 12 more minutes for, for questions. Either John or the panel. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Moyo Narizola. I'm a researcher at the York Center for Research. Uh, I found uh, John's presentation fascinating, and the last time actually I listened to John was uh, somewhere else where he uh, emphasized on the uh, Afghan government officials reading his reports more carefully. I was wondering if, if he has any experience of uh, donor officials, including the U.S., whether they are reading your reports and how they are reacting to them. But also, I, I also wanted to actually ask a bigger picture question. And that is, uh, to put the lessons learned in context, I think you and Nipa showed that uh, governments uh, vote donors and receive aid receiving countries are not very good in learning lessons. And then the point was lessons into their programming. I don't know much about uh, fragility and uh, Mali and, uh, and Haiti, but in Afghanistan, uh, what happens is development work happens in a security context. So the project in Afghanistan is largely a counterterrorism mission. The state building component was added later on. Some say it's an under-resourced uh, uh, state building project, but you also showed that whatever was there was even that is too much. Maybe too much is also a, 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 a problem. So whether that also NIPA enumerated uh, the Canadian engagement uh, uh, in Canada, uh, starting with the first uh, uh, mission all the way to the New Impact Project uh, that compares to the Boats Project and others. So all that shows that there is inability to learn, number one. And number two, when your development program is in service of a larger security agenda, uh, how much is it realistic to expect different outcomes? Because at the end of the day, you're not there to change the lives of the people. You are there to show some metrics. Because development in Afghanistan, the way aid, uh, uh, progress, or progress is measured is not really by impact, uh, it's really by the amount of money spent and all those billions that John showed uh, are a testament to that. So I guess that brings me to traditional development. Uh, because if you're doing, you know, this type of development work in service of a larger security agenda, you're, you're only working towards security goals. And those are like clearly the areas, uh, John said that, you know, that the uh, stabilization definition was from the time you kick the bad guys out until you know, another uh, timeline. But actually, it's between two intervals. The bad guys are coming back. And whatever you do is so fragile. 
whatever you try to build, whatever you try to do, with the return of that uh, <coughs> guys, you're losing whatever you have invested in your time. So for that, I think there is room to discuss about traditional uh, development, where you're not actually putting aid in what you know, Mark Duffy used to say in the security world, securitization of aid. And Canada is actually a good example. Canada uh, would move from the military uh, combat operations, and they focused on health, education, and women's issues. Now, Nima also showed us that in that also they don't have a very you know, wonderful record of uh, uh, delivering things. But I guess maybe that's a good focus. Uh, maybe we should encourage that uh, traditional development, and also not just by governments. I think we should acknowledge the work of the non government organizations uh, like CARE, like the Alhan, like the other civil children and others. So with that, okay. I'm um, sorry, in the more context of time, I'd like to take a few few other questions. So that's a lot. Uh, for you, this, we, we make one, one, one last round. Yes, I see one, two, three. Okay, last three questions, and please please tell us to whom the question is directed and then we'll let it. The question is to the panel. I'm Jean-Marc Mangin, the former UN, former GAP, former UN executive, NGO executive. Uh, the um, I'd like to follow up to the, a, a couple of questions. That are the in, in a situation where there's widespread corruption, widespread insecurity, you don't control the borders, um, the the uh, and 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 drug trade is is uh, is, is, uh, is an important part of the uh, of, of the economy and the political governments. The, the the how much good can you still do? And I, I, I think I want to take a more positive aspect of the, 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 at, at, a, at the modest level, the, 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 the capacity building with some, some actors at, at the field, which is done in a long term aspect and, and the trust building aspect. If there are bad guys around, it's, it's, it's not impossible. So maybe a reaction to that comment. The, and then, then a, 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 a question on the conditionality. Uh, it's, it's been around for a long time. Uh, the, uh, where